Good morning and welcome to the Johnson Space Center. Thank you for joining us here this morning for the joint post-flight press conference for the STS-71 and Mir-18 crew members. Now to start the conference and to introduce the rest of the crew members is the commander of STS-71, Navy Captain Robert Scoot Gibson. Scoot. Thank you, Eileen, and welcome to the post-flight press conference for Mir-18 and STS-71. It was a bit of a complex mission, and so I'm sure the debriefing will be done in a little bit of a complex way. Uh, but first, let me start off and introduce the, the two crews that we have here in Houston today. Uh, seated immediately to my right, our mission pilot for STS-71, Charlie Precourt. Next to Charlie, our payload commander and mission specialist number one, Dr. Ellen Baker. Next to Ellen, our flight engineer, mission specialist number two, Dr. Greg Harbaugh. Uh, seated next to Greg, our mission specialist number three, and the Mir-18 backup crew member, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. And then we have the crew of Mir-18, uh, starting with the Bort engineer, uh, Mr. Gennady Strykalov, the commander of Mir-18, Vladimir Dejurov, and our very own cosmonaut researcher aboard Mir-18, Dr. Norm Tiger. And uh, if we could start right in with the uh, slides, the STS-71 slides. Uh, we uh, had a crew patch that was designed by famous aviation artist Bob McCall. Uh, Bob also designed the, the crew emblem for the Apollo Soyuz docking, uh, which of course took place back in 1975. So it was a real pleasure for us to have Bob involved once again uh, with the design of ours. We lifted off uh, three months and about two weeks after the launch of, uh, of Mir 18, and we're finally on our way after a lot of uh, a lot of preparations. We, of course, launched into a ground-up rendezvous uh, aimed at intercepting and rendezvousing with the Mir. So we did a number of rendezvous burns with the Ohms engines to put us on the right flight path to, uh, to intercept and, and actually dock. And this is one of those Ohms burns uh, performed in the dark. And I think this was our major height adjust burn that we did on the first day to raise our orbit up very close to the Mir. Here's a uh, photo of Anatoly and Nick. Anatoly Solovyev, the commander, of course, of Mir-19, who's now on board, and Nik Nikolai Bodarin. Uh, the, uh, the four Russians, actually, all four of them, I can't think of four finer gentlemen to represent Russia, as well as four finer friends that we've uh, come to know them as. We'll really be looking forward to getting back together with Anatoly and Nick after their landing in uh, Kazakhstan and back in Russia when we can visit them after their mission's over in the next month. This is uh, a shot of the activity during rendezvous uh, from the flight deck. You can see Greg working away with the handheld laser taking range and range rate marks on the mirror. And I'm uh, in the photo in the lower right hand corner uh, operating a, hand, a laptop computer to uh, control the uh, trajectory control system lasers that were also used uh, from the payload bay to get that kind of information for the uh, rendezvous. Greg and Charlie and Hoot were operating the afterflight deck. Uh, I was up in the front with the VHF radio, and, and my job was to conduct communications with the mirror. We were able to make contact on time and then to exchange various calls on distance, uh, range rate, and one particularly important call at 55 feet when I called out our range at 55 feet so that the mirror could desaturate uh, their gyrodynes and then uh, disable their attitude control. We had a very spectacular view of the Mir space station as we were closing in, uh, gradually decreasing the range on flight day three, uh, leading into the rendezvous. Uh, that's an early shot of it. Here's a little bit later shot after the Mir has maneuvered to attitude and feathered the solar arrays getting ready for us to dock. Well, this is kind of an interesting view. In the lower viewport there is Volodya taking that video of us approaching, and then in the smaller upper window is Norm with another camera. Uh, I guess it was around this point where Hoot was thinking about maybe negotiating a price for the final closure. Uh, and then this is a view from the app flight deck uh, showing the hard mate, what it looked like out the window. And uh, this picture doesn't do it justice in the sense that uh, that whole big space station was just right outside that window. It was real close by. You may have seen, and we're about to show a video in just a minute that'll show a lot of this. Uh, we got to recreate 
uh, an event that took place 20 years ago, almost to the day, uh, the handshake between Tom Stafford and Alexei Leonov in the Apollo Soyuz docking, and of course we were able to recreate this on flight day three of STS-71. The earlier slide showed the uh, view out the aft window. This one gets a little bit of uh, three out of the four windows. The mirror, of course, is huge and just filled up our view as we looked out the flight deck. So we took a couple different camera angles with a few different lenses, but I'll tell you, none of them really can convey what it, it did look like. Uh, you could just catch little clips of it uh, with the camera. We also thought about trying to get some different views of the orbiter than uh, what you normally see. This is a picture that I took out of the Kavant 2 module out of that large uh, viewport that uh, Volodya had been taking the movies from earlier. Uh, and this view is uh, over the Crimea, and uh, the Dnieper River is uh, very clearly evident there. And then here's a shot of Hoot that uh, we took uh, also from uh, the same window. Uh, nice close up, you can see he's got a big smile on his face there. This is a view of the orbiter tail, of course, and in the top of the picture is starburst view of the sun gleaming through some of the equipment. You see the do docking targets there uh, located on the mirror structure. Uh, this is from a port in the Kristall module as you transfer immediately leaving the ODS or the orbiter docking system headed into the mirror. As you float by there, you have this porthole that gives you this view, and every time you float by there, you, you think to yourself, you've just got to capture this photo somehow. and uh, it, uh, the colors are so brilliant and the size of the vehicle is so impressive sitting there right next to you that uh, it's a really inspiring view. And uh, on the inside, coming uh, from where I took the picture forward towards the, uh, the module, the, the base block part of the module, this is in the crystal and uh, it gives you a great perspective on uh, how tight a squeeze it was to get through uh, from the orbiter into the crystal and a lot of the equipment that's located in uh, the modules as you head towards the, the base block. Well, immediately uh, after uh, opening the hatch, we uh, exchanged uh, positions in various modules. This happens to be uh, after one of the ceremonies in which we presented uh, Anatoly with his Houston's rocket shirt. It was a little hard for him, to, I think, to remove it. Uh, this is in the base block, and it's uh, in front of the table. I have to mention that uh, Anatoly became a fan in Russia. One Sunday, uh, there was a Houston Rockets game broadcast uh, over to Russia. They won by one point. We were in class the next day, and all he could talk about was that game. So he's a real fan. And of course, uh, immediately after opening the hatch, it was like coming to the home of, a, of old friends because the Mir 18 crew invited us into the base block. and. I got to say hi to the uh, people we'd watch launch in uh, March, and it was a real nice experience to be greeted by uh, Gennady. Well, we had a lot to do, of course, once the, uh, the ships were connected, and <coughs> part of their main objective was to uh, gather some physiologic data on Norm and Gennady and Volodya uh, after their three-month stay, and so we got busy in the lab right away. In fact, we got the lab up and running prior to docking, and uh, the day after docking, got busy with a lot of our activities. Uh, in this uh, photo, I'm working with Gennady on the barrel experiment. Uh, there will be a lot of discussion, has been a lot of discussion about the various physiological experiments that we've conducted. But the barrel receptors of the neck are partially responsible for making sure that you keep blood in your head when you stand up very rapidly or for people who come back from long space flights uh, are able to walk around. It's, it's involved in the cardiovascular system. Uh, it's an experiment that's flown before on space and life sciences space lab flights. And uh, Gennady, w Gennady was not only a, a real trooper when it came to taking the measurements, he was really an active participant in making sure we got good data as well. And uh, there was a bit of transition for the Mir-18 crew to transition to be STS-71 crew members, so I had to go uh, Rope Veloja into uh, getting into the lab occasionally. Uh, he had a lot to do in the mirror to, to get ready for his departure, and uh, we, of course, had a lot going on in the space lab uh, getting ready for our return. 
One of our big activities during the doc phase for those uh, of us who were not doctors or scientists was transferring equipment. Um, and here I'm filling a, a water tank. <coughs> we actually transferred uh, roughly two and a half times the amount of water that it was originally targeted. And we uh, transferred from the orbiter to near, I think, 250 pieces of hardware and returned 200 pieces of hardware. Uh, with a success rate of about 99%. Uh, uh, there were just a couple of things that uh, evidently were not accounted for. But we actually came back with a couple of things we didn't plan on coming back for, so we, uh, we did better than 100% all told. This is a photo taken from inside the Soyuz descent module while we were doing uh, communications checkouts the day prior to undocking. I had the distinct privilege of being able to climb in there with Anatoly and Nick while we did this checkout and uh, snapped this photo while we were talking through the relay communication system with Houston and with uh, Moscow. It was a real enchanted moment for me. And here's uh, Nick with his two buddies uh, <laughs> getting ready for the, uh, the next day's activities. They were doing suit checkouts, of course, uh, to prepare for the Soyuz undocking. One of the cornerstones of this program from the very start was uh, adaptability and flexibility, both on the ground and in flight. And this is uh, a small update to the undock procedure we received the, the morning of undocking. And here's a shot. Uh, this was taken of Anatoly and Nikolai uh, just before closing the hatch prior to, uh, prior to undocking the night before undocking. And this was our, uh, our last chance to shake their hands and tell them farewell until we get to see them again when they come back. Uh, this is a shot of the Soyuz uh, after it had undocked and prior to uh, our undocking, actually during it, uh, Nikolai was up in a window in the front called the blister taking uh, pictures and video of uh, our undocking. Uh, we could see uh, the whole Soyuz out the, uh, the commander's window on the uh, port side of the, the shuttle. It was a busy time, the docking, undocking, and fly around time. Uh, we were lucky that we could get the camera out the window every now and then. Um, we intended to take a lot more pictures than we did, but it was just so busy on the flight deck doing the real work that we didn't have the opportunities that we thought we would prior to flight. And as we left uh, the Soyuz, uh, you could see it in the horizon. It eventually uh, receded into darkness and became a star, which we saw for several days uh, following that. And, uh, of course, as Bonnie said, we, uh, once the fly around was done and the separation was done, it sort of disappeared into the distance and uh, we could ca catch a glimpse of it uh, on some of the night passes. Uh, it was uh, hard saying goodbye to our friends and uh, we do look forward to seeing them again. We did get a few shots, uh, not many of, uh, for Earth observation. Uh, this shot actually at the coast of California gives a near look at the weather stopping at the coast and uh, some of the topography and, and some of the fault lines in that area. We shot a couple of interesting photos. Like, like Bonnie said, we didn't get a lot of time to look at the Earth, but uh, this was one of the shots. And once in a while, over cold water, over the ocean, you'll have cold water clouds above them. And when a ship goes through underneath, it'll precipitate a change in the clouds, and you're able to see a ship wake reflected in the actual clouds up over the water. And that's what we see in this picture here. Had some nice passes over South America. This is uh, a pass over the Andes Mountains. My crewmates reluctantly, reluctantly allowed me to put this photo in here since I'm from this area. It's the one of the more recognizable features of land on the planet at least for those who are from there. You can see clearly Boston, Cape Cod, at the bottom of the picture, Martha's Vineyard. My hometown is up <laughs> under the clouds that are in the uh, upper left corner there, Hudson, Massachusetts. Thanks to my crewmates for letting me show that with you. It's, under the, it's always cloudy there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Uh, as you probably saw, we came back and landed at the end of a 10-day uh, mission, and for the first time, uh, in space, we had together a 10-person crew, and so we were able to make one of the largest uh, starburst pictures uh, on orbit that anyone has, has, ever, has ever been able to put together. Uh, we had an 11th person taking the photo for us here. Uh, with that, why don't we move right into the video?
Uh, we've put together a, a film clip of the activities of STS-71. And uh, again, the, the crew emblem designed by, by Bob McCall. The breakfast, in this case, was a lunch. And of course, the crew members again, the pilot, Charlie Precourt, Nikolai Buterin, who's uh, aboard the Mir still, uh, the Mir 19 commander, Anatoly Soloviev, uh, Luke Gibson, of course, my payload commander, Ellen Baker, and Dr. Bonnie Dunbar and Greg Harbaugh. Uh, we walked out at uh, oh, early afternoon. This was a whole lot nicer day to be walking out to the orbiter than the previous mm -hmm. attempt had been uh, when they had to actually put the crew van under the awning because the rain was coming down too hard. And so we had to make a, uh, a quick ingress into the, into the vehicle. There's a good shot of Hoot uh, when we finally got the go for launch. Uh, two minutes, visors down, pseudo two on, and have a good flight. We were off and running. Uh, most folks uh, maybe don't realize that rendezvous started right here. We had a five minute launch window, and uh, we had to wait for the moment in time when Mir's orbit uh, was right directly overhead of us, and we could insert ourselves into the same plane that they were in. Um, and uh, we hit that uh, right on time on this particular day. The weather cooperated, and uh, it was a magnificent launch. Uh, Anatoly and Nick uh, were very impressed with uh, the vehicle, uh, and we were off and running with a great start here. Okay, once we got on orbit, we had uh, an awful lot of work to do to get ready for the rendezvous. Uh, we opened the payload bay doors. You can see the docking mechanism sitting there with the six uh, black dots on the, the forward end of it. Uh, we had just a tremendous amount of activity at the end of flight day one and then all of flight day two, getting our computers ready to go, uh, getting our rendezvous tools set up. We had one or two unexpected events, uh, including uh, a little work that had to be done on the handheld laser, but we got ready to go in time. We flew an intercept on the mirror that had us uh, pick up the radius vector or essentially come in right underneath the mirror and fly up below them all the way into docking. Uh, this was a pretty intensive period as uh, Bonnie and Greg have alluded to on the flight deck uh, with the, uh, uh, the three of us flying and everyone else helping as we come in. This is a shot uh, that you saw earlier from the, from the mirror of the orbiter over the Red Sea. We had a very narrow corridor that we had to intercept and fly up so as not to disturb any of the solar arrays on the mirror with our plumes. And as we got into about 500 feet or so, the mirror started its maneuver to the final attitude for docking. And as it did that, we were able to start locking on with the TCS laser system uh, because on the end of the docking module were the reflectors that that system could lock onto. So I'm coordinating that activity here with the ground controllers. And you'll see a shot here briefly of uh, that final maneuver, you can see the docking node uh, in the center there starting to come more in alignment with our axis, and you can also see the, the relative motion of the solar arrays in this particular view. And uh, we uh, were pretty much at the end of this event when the mirror was in attitude, we were ready to go on with it. As, as Ben had alluded, it was a very vi busy time. Uh, we had, again, several calls going back and forth between the mirror and, and the shuttle as uh, docking occurred. We borrowed a little bit of video uh, from the, uh, the Mir 18 crew on that sequence. As you may recall, we moved into 30 feet and held for five minutes waiting for the timing to get exactly right. Uh, it was our objective in the course of the rendezvous not to have to fire any braking pulses towards the mirror, and we were able to work the, uh, the timeliness, the closure rates, and the distances such that that worked out just fine. We were able to utilize natural orbital braking to bring us all the way into docking and never did have to fire a braking pulse all the way in. Uh, this is the actual moment of docking as seen from the aft flight deck uh, from the one of the payload bay cameras looking out. And this is a shot that came down to the ground that showed both the centerline camera view as well as the view out the, uh, out the aft flight deck. Uh, as you probably recall, we had a very tight window on the actual docking. Well, this was the hard part. We had six people with cameras on one side of the hatch and <laughs> two people with cameras on the other side of the hatch. And uh, of course, everybody wanted to get a good picture. Uh, we had a variety of different cameras, stills, videos, IMAX, uh, you name it, we had it. Uh, we didn't want to miss 
the hatch opening and the handshake, and you'll see we're flashing uh, lights in each other's faces here. But it was an awfully exciting time, and we just couldn't wait to get that hatch open and, and greet our comrades. We had been training and preparing for this moment for so long uh, over the preceding year, uh, working together with the MIR-18 and the MIR-19 crews. Uh, when the actual moment came, we found ourselves looking around and saying, are we really here, and if we really, have we really made this work? had just a very brief greeting and a very brief uh, ceremony, if you will, at the actual hatch. Uh, and of course, this was the first time that we had seen Norm and Volodya and Gennady, uh, I guess in the previous, what, eight months, I guess it had been since we had seen them. And of course, going a little out of plan, uh, uh, we had we had a plan prior to this, and the uh, first thing we did was take that plan and toss it, and we all uh, <laughs> lined up and uh, and uh, went into the mirror at that time. All, all ten of us, I guess, were in there at that time, and uh, I kept the camera running as we uh, went through the crystal module and uh, arrived in the base block where we did our uh, welcoming ceremony at the So there we were all uh, accumulating ourselves in the base block or the core module, uh, obviously elated, really happy to see uh, uh, Gennady and Volodya and Norm, and they were, I think, happy to see us. Uh, I think it's the first time there have been 10 human beings in one spacecraft, and uh, to uh, commemorate the occasion, Bonnie put a STS-71 crew patch up on one of their uh, comm pieces of equipment. The following day then we uh, congregated back in the space lab and we performed a gift exchange and we also mated a model of the Mir space station uh, with the uh, space shuttle. A little bit adrift. <laughs> Uh, there was also a tour of the space shuttle that was conducted for Russian audiences. Uh, Norm did this, and in these sequences, he's taking Gennady around the shuttle, and he'll later narrate this for a Russian audience, first uh, in the commander's seat and now back in the aft flight deck uh, where Charlie is showing him the controls for the docking adapter. Well, once we got all the PAO events out of the way, we could get to work on some of the science objectives of the of the flight and uh, the day after docking we did start on some of the experiments. We had a small series of experiments to do on this flight that looked primarily at the cardiovascular system, uh, exercise, fitness, uh, endurance, those sorts of things, and also some metabolic studies to look at biochemical, hormonal changes in the blood, changes in the blood chemistry, things like that. And uh, Bonnie and I orchestrated most of this. Uh, couldn't have done it, obviously, without our subject participation and full cooperation. And uh, it was a pretty long day. As Ellen mentioned, we had, uh, had rehearsed this before, and with our uh, payload operations control center down here on the ground, the POC, uh, it all went as planned. Uh, as uh, was previously men mentioned, uh, we performed several barrel experiments on all three of the subjects, got some excellent quality data, and we're very happy with it. Uh, Ellen also performed a number of metabolic experiments called NGAS. Here she's connecting up a rebreathing uh, bag uh, to Volodya. And uh, we also flew the lower body negative pressure device as a joint experiment between the Russians and the Americans. We had principal investigators from both countries on all of our studies. Uh, the Russians used lower body negative pressure as a countermeasure. We use it as a research tool, and we used it as a little of both on this flight. Greg is wincing because uh, he's having his blood taken there, and he'd rather be jogging like I am here, I think. <laughs> it didn't really hurt. Okay, <laughs> we, as uh, mentioned earlier, we did an awful lot of transferring of equipment, uh, scientific and uh, materiel. Here, Hoot is transferring something called the PCG, <coughs> and it's just uh, one example of the, the uh, tremendous amount of 
effort we put into those five dock days and moving stuff back and forth between the two vehicles. Uh, one unsung um, tremendous capability of the shuttle is its ability to return hardware back to Earth, and uh, we took full advantage of it on this flight. Uh, one of the more pleasant things we had the opportunity to do was talk to school kids around the world. We had uh, SARX contacts in California, Texas, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and over in Russia. We used the SARX radios on board both the station Mir and uh, the shuttle. And as we showed in our slide, one of the big moments for us was to be able to uh, show the new rocket Dimmler and present the shirt to uh, Anatoly, uh, who promptly put it on and decided to demonstrate his uh, <laughs> basketball style, which I'm sure that is the envy of anyone who's been in zero-g. <laughs> Here we are closing the hatch, and uh, we've already said our last goodbye there. Um, and then uh, there's Anatoly saying goodbye to us, eating a tortilla through the <laughs> one of the viewports on Kvant. Greg and Bonnie were talking there about getting pressure checks done as we prepared for this moment. Uh, the Soyuz undocks from the mirror on the opposite end of the station and begins its fly around. Uh, we watched it with amazement at uh, how well controlled it was and how stable. And Ellen's in the process of snapping it on the IMAX here, which uh, came out quite well. We got to review that the other day. But Anatoly flew out of plane here, as you see him moving between the panels to a position about. 60, 80 meters uh, to the commander's side of the orbiter, I guess the port side, and uh, station kept there while we prepared to do our undocking. These scenes make the uh, Soyuz look pretty small and look pretty far away. Let me tell you how close he looked when he was sitting out there. His, uh, I guess he had a laser rangefinder, and you can see some of the jet firings here as he was holding attitude uh, just right out the window. We felt like we could reach out and touch him uh, because he was that close to us. His range, I think, was about 65 meters, uh, but again, he looked very, very close uh, at the, uh, at the, as the actual time for undocking approached. At about uh, three minutes prior to the actual separation, I sent the command to open the hooks, and everything worked just like clockwork. That mechanism worked superbly. And there was a set of push-off springs that separated the two vehicles initially, and then at about two feet, who'd initiated a, a separation maneuver, four pulses, to complete the uh, set sequence. This is a view, I guess, from the Soyuz, looking at us as we do that undocking. Of course, when we finally separated, uh, the Mir-18 crew came up waved goodbye. We had some exchanges uh, on the VHF radio as well as we said sayonara. Uh, you're also seeing on the left there the Soyuz redocking. It was a uh, uh, little departure from our plan to uh, dock uh, an orbit later, but uh, you can just see it start to close in there. Anatoly did an excellent job. He, uh, I was in the commander seat. He flew from the uh, port side to the starboard pot side of the vehicle and did a very smooth redocking. Uh, as we com uh, completed that part of the, the fly around and got the photo there, we started a complete uh, revolution around the mirror and got these real pretty views of uh, the station. And here you can see it uh, rotating. Um, the uh, folks on the ground were very interested to see views of the different sides of the mirror to see what kind of condition it's been in after a long exposure to space. As Charlie mentioned, we flew all the way around the mirror. Uh, doing more than a 360-degree fly around and uh, finally got to a point overhead the mirror on what we call the minus R bar and did our final separation burn and started translating away uh, from the mirror space station. Well, <coughs> shortly after that, we continued our work in the lab. Uh, of course, one of the things that would be important for Norm and his crew members to do is to maintain their conditioning and anticipation of entry. Uh, the intent was to exercise twice a day. I think we missed that a few times for, for those guys, but they did manage to get some of their exercise in. And another modification we did was to use the recumbent seats of the shuttle. 
uh, so that they would have the gravity vector going through their chest rather than from the head to the toes and make the g-forces of re-entry a lot easier on them. This of course shows the shuttle as we uh, re-entered, flew around the hack and uh, came down final approach. Uh, the uh, one little surprise we got on final was a master alarm, which proved to be a false sensor indication, but uh, it, uh, we just pressed right on at uh, 300 feet. I lowered the gear here and uh, hoot set up on the outer glide path just nice and solid and brought it on in. We were a relatively lightweight orbiter, about 219,000 pounds uh, coming in for landing, so we were shooting at a 195 knot touchdown. Uh, as opposed to the heavyweight flights where we shoot at 205 knots. And this is us touching down on runway 15 uh, at the Kennedy Space Center on uh, July the 7th, uh, ending a, a very successful 10-day flight. We, of course, used the drag chute. We had a normal drag chute deploy. Uh, for this landing, we had a little bit of crosswind, not enough to cause us any real difficulty, and uh, we're able to fly a normal approach and landing all the way through the uh, drag chute deployment and drag chute jettison that you see here. <laughs> 